Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be at Oak Grove Pentecostal Holy Church this morning. And um, we are uh, glad that you're tuning in on Facebook or whatever. And uh, we just want to say that we appreciate uh, the official board asking us to come in and fill in the pulpit today. Um, we, we thank you for the invitation. And so I'm hoping that uh, uh, Oak Grove Church is here tuning in, watching us as uh, we give forth this message today. So call somebody. Uh, call them up and tell them that they need to listen to this message. God, we've got a message today just for you. And I'm hoping that uh, the ladies that usually sit on the second pew up here uh, are watching. The ones that I call the Amen Corner. Uh, I hope Miss uh, Sister Crawford watching, Brother Wiggins, Brother Hood, and all the people and family of the Old Grove uh, Pentecostal Holy Church. But it's good to be here uh, this morning. Um, I, I got a message today that um, I want to call, Who Are You Looking At? Who are you looking at this morning? Uh, I want to go ahead and just jump into uh, the sermon. Uh, we just want God to move in this uh, sermon today uh, and just uh, allow him to do something great in your life. Uh, from Genesis to, uh, chapter 13, verse 14, God is speaking to Abraham, and uh, Abraham is one that God has chosen uh, to be the father of the nation of Israel. And uh, we see how that, that uh, in the 14th verse, it says, uh, God tells Abraham, he says, lift up thy eyes and look. And I kind of want to just talk this morning about our eyes and looking uh, this morning and how we see. Um, sight is one of the most uh, miraculous things that God has, has made to man. Uh, we uh, wouldn't be anything without sight. We have to be able to see. God knew that. And so miraculously, uh, through his creation, he was able to uh, give us uh, eyes to, to be able to see and, and, and in that process, we find that, that uh, it is, we can see color, we can see shapes, we can see forms, uh, we can see all kinds of things. We can see God's creation. Uh, and uh, the eye side is, is miraculously. And as God was speaking to Abraham, Abraham had left the Earl of Chaldea. Abraham had uh, left his family, had gone out on his own and going out under God's direction and supervision and, and if you please, as God watched him, God was watching over Abraham and God blessed Abraham. The Bible says that Abraham was a wealthy man. Uh, the Bible says that he had uh, plenty of uh, camels and goats and sheep. Uh, and uh, so uh, Abraham was wealthy. And in, that, in this process that we find this morning that uh, Abraham was uh, looking down, uh, God was telling Abraham to look up, uh, and uh, just as Abraham um, had looked and saw his uh, nephew Lot uh, look out to the uh, plains of the Jordan uh, 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 plateaus, and and as uh, God, uh, as Abraham saw Lot uh, leave him uh, there uh, uh, and forsook him. Uh, there on that mountainside. But God looked at Abraham and said, Abraham, I want you to lift your eyes now. I'm sure that Abraham uh, uh, probably was kind of discouraged and Lot leaving him. He, he loved Lot. He cared for Lot and the family. And he did not want this separation, but there was Lot's choice. And, and so God was saying to Abraham, uh, cheer up, Lot. Uh, Abraham, I, I, I want you to look. I want you to lift your eyes. I want you to see. And God told Abraham, he said, don't you look to the, the northward, the southward, the eastward, and the westward. Then in verse 15, he says, for the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. There was a, a tremendous blessing there uh, as uh, uh, God was preparing Abraham to go into the promised land. And Abraham, uh, he was telling Abraham, I want you to see it, Abraham. As Abraham looked out across the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Canaan land, 
uh, that flowed with milk and honey. As uh, Abraham looked out there, God said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you all this uh, uh, for an inheritance. And, and Abraham became uh, the father of the faithful. We know that uh, uh, there's a word that Israel used today. Uh, and they say uh, many times, don't worry, be useful. Don't worry, be useful. And we're told that uh, today uh, that many of them would, would go across to the nation of Israel proclaiming that motto, don't worry, be useful. And we're told that when the, uh, they were, uh, uh, the terrorists were firing rockets down on the Israel, they were crying out, don't worry, be useful. No matter whether they were in the bunkers or, or where they, they were, uh, they were crying out, don't worry, be useful. And we find that they would go from the, the, the shores of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea over to the shores of the Jordan River. They would go all the way down to the, the plains of the si, uh, Sinai P Peninsula. And also we, we're told that uh, all the way up to Assyria and Lebanon, we're told that they would cry out this great motto, uh, don't worry, be usual. But I believe the church this morning has a motto I believe the church this morning can say the same thing, but change it in a different way. Don't worry, it's Jesus. Don't worry, it's Jesus. No matter what church uh, uh, you attend today, don't worry. No matter what you're going through this morning, don't worry. No matter where you are this morning, don't worry. Because it is Jesus. Uh, it's Jesus uh, that rises in the morning. It's Jesus uh, as you get up and go through the day. It's Jesus uh, that when you lay your head down on the pillar. It's Jesus uh, that, uh, that gives us that assurance to know that no matter what comes or what goes, uh, in the time of pandemic, in the time of diseases, in the time of, of heartaches, in the time of death, in the time of sorrow, it doesn't matter because it is Jesus. We find that the Bible says that Abraham uh, saw. He looked out across that Jordan, uh, that plains, and looked out across the, uh, the, the Canaanite, uh, the Canaanite uh, valleys and all. And, and Abraham saw what God had promised. He saw the, the grass uh, in the valleys. He saw uh, the fruit trees. He saw all that was in the land of Canaan. And God said, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. But also, Abraham looked a little bit further. There was something about Abraham's vision that just uh, did not stop uh, uh, in Canaan land. It did, just didn't stop uh, as uh, Abraham uh, walked uh, across uh, uh, the, uh, the Canaan uh, uh, providence. Uh, because the Bible says that Abraham, uh, wherever your foot uh, uh, trods, uh, wherever the soul your foot goes, uh, I'm going to give it to you. And Abraham saw something greater and saw something more because sight uh, uh, is just beyond the limitation of just seeing. Because the Bible tells us uh, that Abraham saw a city. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Abraham saw more than what God just showed him. He looked beyond the plains uh, uh, of the Jordan River. He looked beyond the plains uh, uh, of Lebanon. He looked beyond it all. And he said, I look for a city whose builder and maker is God. Abraham uh, was that one that looked beyond before anybody else uh, looked beyond. Uh, Abraham looked beyond. Jesus had a hard time with the disciples and the Pharisees and all. Because you see, he was wanting to get, open up their eyes. He told them many times, he said, you got eyes, but you don't see. You got ears, but you don't hear. And God was trying to open up their eyes to see uh, what uh, was going on. He wanted them to see what was happening uh, in the land today. And we're told that uh, uh, as, as uh, Abraham looked, and he saw, he saw something beyond the natural. He saw something beyond uh, what the natural eye could see. We're told that uh, in the word, uh, behold, he says, lift up your eyes and see. There are two words uh, 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 that is used, behold, lift up your eyes. It means to perceive. It means to perceive. Look beyond what you see. Look beyond the, the, what, what you actually, your eye sees. 
Put me on it. One writer said this, Israel is not perfect, but our, but, um, our, and our leaders are not perfect. And not all the policies are always wise. But at the most basic level, our hearts are most emphatic with the right place. In other words, they were saying their heart was right, they were wanting God, they were looking for God to do something great in the land of Israel. But I want to know, do we know that God is looking at us? In Psalms 33, uh, verse 18, it says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. The eye of the Lord, God sees you. And we know that. That's no problem. We know that God looks down upon us. We know that God sees us when we get up in the morning. God knows our, our goings, our comings, the Bible says. There's nothing that, that we do that God does not see. And we understand that. But we thank God we know that God looks upon us. We thank God that, that uh, he notices us and, and uh, has, has that specialness about us that he wants to see what's going on in our life. But I wonder this morning, are you able to see him? Because you see, when th uh, things get rough and when times come and hardships come and, and, there, and there are diseases everywhere, are you able to see him? Can you look through the cloud? Uh, and see that God is still on the throne. Can you look beyond the circumstances? Can you look beyond this morning, the situation that you're in? John's Gospel, chapter 1, and verse 5. It said that the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Oh, I'm so glad today that God came in the midst of our, of our darkness. In the midst of our troubles, in the midst of times, in the midst of, of when we, we find ourselves uh, the weakest and we find ourselves uh, the loneliness and we may find ourselves the most difficult times, the Bible says, God, that light shines in darkness. There's no, there's no darkness that God cannot shine in. The, 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 the darkness of, of the, the night cannot get too dark. I looked out the window last night and I mentioned to my wife, boy, it's dark out there. There was no clouds or there was no moonlight shining. There was no stars shining. It was just darkness consumed everything. And, that, it, and that's the way our lives are. We find our, ourselves, our lives are full of darkness sometimes. And there was a time that, that darkness consumed us. There was a time that darkness overwhelmed us. And there are times today that there are times that the darkness is so dark that people will go and they'll commit suicide. People will go and, and they'll, they'll kill themselves because the darkness is so great. But I'm glad to know today that in the midst of darkness, there's a light to shine. There, in the midst of darkness, that we can, we can comprehend it. The Bible says that when Jesus came, the darkness was so great uh, that, that they didn't comprehend it. He, Jesus came as the Word. But yet those that were closest to the Word could not see it. Jesus came as the living Word. He was, thus said the Lord. He was the Word of God in flesh. But they did not see it. They did not comprehend it. They did not grasp it. They were selfish. They were ungodly. They were wicked. They were, were, were in, in, in doubt and fear. They were unbelievers. But even though they were the ones that should have seen the word before, even though they should have been the ones that, that saw, if they should have been the ones that, whose eyes should have been opened up. But we told that the, the artists did not comprehend it. They couldn't grasp it. And so it said that as he came. Um, in verse 14 of John chapter 1, it says this. We beheld his glory. We beheld his glory. John said yes. Yes, there were some that, that would not look. 
There was some that would not perceive. There was some that, that refused to, to see upon him or look upon him as the living word. But John said, we beheld his glory. Hallelujah. The word beheld here means carefully to observe. Oh, there were those that carefully observed him as he walked the shores of Galilee. There were those that carefully observed him as he reached out and he touched the leper. There were those that carefully observed him to those that were in need to the sick, to the sick. For you see, Jesus said that there are many Christ, but there's only one. I want you to have carefully observe this morning, that one this morning. I want you to look at the one. Oh, there's people running everywhere, all over the world, and presenting themselves as the answer, as the solution to the difficulties, only never to match up or never to come up to what the truth is. There's only one Jesus. There's only one word. There's only one Lord. There's only one Savior. There's only one Redeemer. There's only one this morning that can come in the darkness and save us and deliver us. There's only one. John is saying, I've taken careful observation. Where he says, there were those, he said, that, they, that, that he, he was preferred before me. John said, the glory of John said this Jesus was before I was. John said that Jesus was there before I was ever born. He was preferred before me. And it's Jesus. John observed him knowing that the prophets of old spoke of him. The prophets proclaimed him as the king of kings. The prophets spoke of him, but yet they did not see him. They did not see. And Jesus even spoke the words. He said, there were those that would love to have seen what you see today. There were those that love uh, to, 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 to be in fellowship, to see what you see, to know what you know. Because the living word was, it is walking in the midst today. Jesus, the Bible says, behold the Lamb of God. It says that John Look carefully. Observe Jesus. He said he observed him in the fullness, having all received grace for grace. John looked at Jesus and he, and he, and he said, I see him as the fullness of the Godhead. I see him as the fullness of God's word. I see him as the fullness of God's love. I see him as the fullness of of God's hope. I see him as the fullness of man's desire today. And John said, I see him full of grace for grace. Oh, there's grace flowing in his eyes. There's grace flowing in his hands. There's grace flowing in his walk. And there was grace flowing uh, in, it, uh, in his garment. Because the Bible says uh, that, that uh, as a as, uh, 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 as they touched the hem of his garment, the Bible says, the virtue, the virtue fell, and the sick woman was healed. The virtue fell, and the blind see. The virtue was there because he had the fullness. John also observed, he said, I gotta make the way straight. John said, I gotta make it way. I'm going to make it straight for those that come behind me. When Jesus can come in the fullness of glory, Jesus can come in the fullness of revelation where that he can present himself to a world that's in full of darkness, a world that was hopeless, a world that needed God, a world that needed a Savior. He said he carefully Carefully, church call somebody today. There's somebody out there this morning that needs to know 
and Jesus. They need to see Jesus this morning to know there is hope. There's a word in the Greek and it's spelled I-D-U-O. And it's used as the word see it. John used that word, it says, John in verse 29 of chapter 1 of, of John's gospel. It says, John seeth. John seeth. No, it's what he's, the word here means calling attention to what may be seen or heard. John was afraid to be called, to call attention to Jesus. Oh, church, are we presenting Jesus? Are we lifting Jesus high this morning? Are we letting the world know that there's a Jesus out there that's able to save? There's a Jesus out there that's able to deliver? There's a Jesus out there that's able. John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, behold the Lamb. He says, I want you to look. I want you to look carefully. I want you to observe. And I want you to pay attention. That you may see there's a Lamb that's able to forgive you of your sins. There's a God that loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Church, God loves you. He says, pay attention. There's no greater sight than that this morning. John said, I paid attention to him. I paid attention to so much that all I can see is the Lamb of God. Call attention. Pay attention. John said, I see a Lamb sacrifice. I'm not looking at the hundreds and thousands and millions of Lambs that have been slain from the time of Abrahamic covenant. I'm not looking at all the bulls and all the goats that spilled their blood. But John said, I'm looking at the sacrifice of lamb. Paying attention to it today. And I think today that our eyesight, our eyesight is not uh, 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 as keen. Our eyesight that is not as sharp as it should be. John said, I'm paying attention. I'm paying attention as a lamb was slain. I'm paying attention. I'm paying, I'm looking. I'm looking at him as his blood became drops or sweat had become blood, drops of blood in the garden. I see the, the stained ground that, that, that is sweat poured down on in the garden of Gethsemane. I'm taking attention. I'm taking notice this morning. I'm going to pay attention to that today. And church, we need to let the world know that there is, that there is a sacrifice. And there is one who shed his blood. John said, I'm paying attention. I'm paying attention as they took him to Pilate's hall and led him down there and they tied him to a, a whipping post. I'm paying attention as they took and they took that whip, the cat of nine tails, uh, and they drew back with everything they got, uh, and they just slashed his back uh, wide open uh, time and time again. I'm paying attention today, oh God. Oh God. Church, we need to let the world know that there's a God today that's willing to take the whip for us. There's a God today that's willing to pay the price uh, that we can be healed. For, our, for by stripes we are healed. By stripes. Pay attention to it. We need to know, let the world know there is a healer that heals today. We need to pay attention as they took him off that whipping post and then begin to uh, pluck his beard and begin to spit on him. We need to pay attention this morning 
of the humiliation as he's stripping naked there before that hall. We need to pay attention this morning and see just this morning that he did that for you and I. That we did not have to be humiliated. But oh God today, hallelujah, we can stand before God the Father one day and we can stand before the judgment of God and we can come and say, oh, he paid the price for me. Oh, he did it for me. I paid attention today to know that my sins are washed away. Today, we see as the blood ran down his face, as he took the crown of the thorns and they put it, and they put it upon his brow. Oh, hallelujah! They took that crown of thorns and, the, and crammed it on his brow, and the blood ran down his face. We need a bad teacher that he took that crown for you and I. We need to pay attention as he took him and as he went, took him up on the Golgotha's hill and laid him on that cross. We need to pay attention today to know that as they lift him up between heaven and earth and there, there on that cross, there on that cross, he bled and died for you and I. We need to pay attention this morning to know huh, that when he said, God will give them for they don't know what to do. He was reaching to the very darkness of mankind because these were his people. These were his kinfolk. These were his people. This were his, his uh, uh, parishioner. He, this was his, his congregation out there. And they were crying out, crucify him. We need to pay attention as he looked out across that congregation and across that people. And he looked down at the eyes of those that just uh, 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 drew, drove the, the nails in his hands. And he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what to do. We need to see that. God forgive us today. That no matter what you've done today, God will forgive you. God wants to forgive you. Oh, I want you to see that today. You don't have to give up. You don't have to be in despair. You don't have to be uh, in distress. But God, God paid it all. Pay the price for you. Now I want you to see, as he gave up the ghost, the Bible says that Jesus closed his eyes and breathed the last breath of air on this creation, on this earth. He gave it up. He let it go. And said, Father, I commend my spirit into your hands. God, from here on out, I'm yours. Here on out is you, Lord. I give my spirit to you. The Bible says that the Roman soldier came over there and took the spear and they jammed it into his side. And the blood and the water just gushed out. He took that sword for you, for you. Pay attention this morning and see. The Bible says that um, uh, John, uh, uh, as John looked, and, and the Bible says that they took Jesus off the the, um, the cross. The Bible says that they wrapped his body in linen cloths. It was getting late. The sun was about to set. And they didn't have time to prepare his body uh, for burial. And they took him and they put it in the, in the tomb of Armathia. There they took Jesus and laid him on that, that tomb, in that tomb. And they took and, and, and uh, they rolled the big stone in front of that, and that tomb. And it said that, that they went back and they prepared for the Passover. They said the first day of the week, the women came and uh, uh, 
They pre was preparing the the um, the body or come to prepare to prepare the body. And the Bible uh, says that John's looked, or should I say Peter looked, and but John used the word Peter saw. The word saw here, it says careful attention. Careful attention. The Bible says that, that when, John, uh, when, when Peter came up to the tomb and he looked in, the tomb was empty. Jesus was not to be found. Jesus' body was not there. For they expected to see a body. They expected to see Jesus dead. But the Bible says that Peter looked carefully and found that the tomb was empty. It was empty. Nowhere was Jesus to be found. But it was empty. His body was empty. No, nowhere there. And then the Bible says that Peter looked and he said he saw the linen clothes lying. The exact spot where they laid Jesus in, in that tomb. The garments that, that they wrapped him up in was laying there the same way that when they left. Now imagine that right before they, they rolled that walk into that, uh, before that, that tomb, uh, imagine they kind of turned around and looked and, and, and kind of thought, he did that for me. He did that for me. He said that, that the linen cloth was laid there on that slab of rock where they laid him. And there we see how that, that uh, the Bible said that the linen cloth was just laying there. As if Jesus' body just kind of disappeared out of those linen cloths. Didn't get up. His body was resurrected. His body was changed within those cloths. His body became spirit. And the cloths laid there. Laid there. And then he said that John looked a little bit closer, or Peter looked a little bit closer. It said that Peter looked careful attention as he looked across there and he saw something else over on the side. It said that, that, that Peter looked, and this is what he said, the napkin about his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but wrapped together in a place by itself. By himself. Corey Tim Boone said this if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Jesus, you'll find rest. Rest. The, the napkins were over on the side. Jesus took time to there. When he was resurrected, Jesus took time to fold the napkins. Took time to fold the napkins. He folded them very carefully. But I want you to get the picture this morning. I want you to see this in that side, inside that tomb. We think it might have been dark, but it wasn't dark because his glory illuminated that place. And Jesus could see with awfulness as Jesus took a napkin that was over his face and eyes. He took the napkin, and the Bible says that it was folded. Carefully. He didn't put it down where his head was because you see, his head was no longer there. He was no longer, he was, he was in that, not in that position. The Bible says that, that Jesus took the napkin and put it in a different place. What is he saying to us today? God is saying to us today that, that your eyes are to behold something different from what you see. Your eyes are to see what you cannot see. To know what you cannot know. I see as Jesus uh, folded these napkins. 
And, uh, but I want you to look at this. He carefully, he carefully folded the napkins. Carefully folded them. Carefully. He took time to fold him and fold this napkin. He was no rush. He was not in a hurry. Well, you see, for 30, 33 years, it would seem like he was in a whirlwind. Well, for 33 years, it seemed like that Jesus was always going somewhere, doing something, never had time for himself. From the time that he was a baby, he was running from Caesar Augustus. As a young man, as a young man called on God, the Bible says that when he was baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit took him and, 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 and he left and up into the mountain. And there on that mountain, there in that mountain, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. I don't know if you have if you've ever fasted a long period of time, but if you have, you know. That, that when you fast, your mind is constantly on food. You're thinking, I could have this or I could have that. All I have to do is break this fast. All I got to do, but, but there's something down deep that said, no, you can't. You, you have an in, uh, inside uh, uh, a struggle. The flesh wants to eat, but the spirit says no. And I'm sure that if Jesus was up on that mountain. Well, you see, he wasn't in the mountain uh, 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 cottage. He couldn't go out over the balcony or the back of that cottage and see the beauty of the terrain. He couldn't go and dwell in the beauty. He was struggling in there in his spirit. He was struggling and in his flesh. And he was constantly struggling to, to fast because he knew he must fast. He knew he must because that was the only way that he could have the power of God in his life. He fasted because he was setting an example for you and I. He fasted. He was setting an example saying, I want you to see this, but I want you to look more than just a fast. I want you to see more than just a hunger, but I want you to know, hallelujah, that you're gaining power with God. I want you to know that you're gaining power and spirituality with God the Father, that God sees your fast. God knows your fast. He's opening it up to you to see. And oh, today, that's why people are praying and fasting, even this through this pandemic. People are praying and fasting because you see God he wants us to see something that we cannot see. He wants us to see beyond this disease. He wants us to see beyond what's going on in our world. And then we find when Jesus come down off of the mountain, he was constantly in a battle. Because you see, in his authority, they were constantly questioning him, his authority. They were constantly questioning uh, uh, what he says. Constantly. He was in that battle. They were trying to trick him. They were seeing lawyers. They were seeing publicans. They were seeing uh, Pharisees. They were seeing all kind of religious leaders to try to trap him. He was constantly on his toes. He was constantly uh, being bombarded by, by being, trying to be trapped. Trying to be trapped. They questioned his authority. They questioned his power. But what power do you do this? He does it through the for the uh, uh, the devil Belzebub. They didn't see when he healed the sick, when he made the lame to walk and the blind to see. They said it's through the devil, but oh, they did not see. They could not see. They didn't understand. They could not comprehend. But Jesus says, "Blessed are those that that, that believe and yet don't see me." Blessed are those that believe in my authority. Blessed are those that believe in my power. Blessed are those that believe in my anointing. Hallelujah. Because you see, we're able to see this morning. I'm hoping this morning that there are people in your, uh, uh, that's watching this morning that's about ready to shout uh, across your living room floor. Because you see, God is telling us that we can see beyond what man wants us to see. Oh, you see, we got politicians. They see this and see the other. 
but I'm here to tell you today how God wants you to see him. God wants you to behold him. God wants you to know today to look beyond what you see. And the sad thing about it is we've got people that come into church. They see glass stained windows. And oh, what a beautiful church this is. Oh, they see uh, paddy pews. Uh, and and, and children is comfortable. Oh, they see a, a, a fine choir. A beautiful piano. Oh, they see all these things. But oh, that, that's all they see. They never see the anointing of God moving and falling upon the sisters of God. They never see the anointing and the presence of God moving across the, the church. They see stuff. They don't see what God wants them to see. They see, they, they, they're, they're all time questioning. I want you to get this now. Jesus was all constantly in turmoil in a sense that, that he was bombarded. He had no rest. Well, one time we're told that he took the rest up in the, uh, the bow of the boat. Oh, he was so tired. He was so worn out. He had prayed. He, uh, he, he had given himself to the people in such a, a, a great way. They, they flocked to him. They wanted to touch him. They, they wanted to hear his words. But oh, he was so tired. And so he said, let's get in the boat. Oh, there's nothing, there's nothing more calmer, more peaceful than being on the boat out in the water and hear the little waves tapping against the side. And it'll put you to sleep. It'll, it's so uh, 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 smooth. It is so good to, to hear that. It will actually is so. But in Jesus' case, even when he was trying to sleep, he said that, that, that he, while he was sleeping, we're told that, uh, that, that all of a sudden the winds begin to rise and the, and the, uh, and the, what, the waves begin to toss. Uh, you know, you think about that. You would think God the Father saw his God the Son. And you would think that he, um, would have said, you know, I'm going to let my son rest today. I'm going to give my son a peaceful day of rest. But that wasn't the case. He could have done that, but he didn't. Just as sometimes we find ourselves in storms and we wonder why. We find ourselves in turmoil and we wonder why. But I'm here to tell you this morning, God, God has something to show you today. He's wanting to show you out of storm. And we're told that the disciples came and shook Jesus up. Lord, get up. Care not that we, we perish. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. You see, he was constantly healing the sick. He was constantly casting out demons. He was constantly calming the wind and telling the rain to stop. But you say, but you see, he carefully Carefully, in that tomb. I want you to get that picture. Carefully. I want you to get this picture. Holding the napkin. Holding the napkin. When for 33 years, all the turmoil, going to the cross, and dying the death to a martyr, Jesus finally was able, able to fold the napkin. Well, you see, outside the tomb, the priests were cleaning up the mess of the earthquakes. There were people everywhere running to and fro because of what happened just a few days before that. There was stress everywhere. The disciples hid themselves. Uh, uh, people did not know what was going on. The sun refused to shine. Oh, there was so much going on outside. But Jesus was on the inside. Just folding the napkin. Folding the napkin. He's, and really, and what we're seeing in that is Jesus said, No more stressed out. No more perplexions. No more difficulties. When he hung on the cross, he, the Bible said, It is finished. And there, it was finished. It was finished. He had time 
He had time to fold a napkin. But I want you to look at this. As he folded a napkin, it could have been said, Lord, you have a kingdom to build. Lord, you've got a church to grow. Lord, you've got saints to, uh, to sanctify, to save and fill the Holy Ghost. Lord, you've got a mansion to build because you're promising to us. Lord, you, you've got intercessive prayer to be made. But no, he's folding the napkin and saying to us today, He's the King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. He paid a debt that he did not owe. But I owed a debt I could not pay. The great um, lady that called Helen Keller said that she made a great deal or a great deal has been said uh, and written about the blind. She was blind and also deaf. But I think she wrote at least seven books. It says, yet persons well informed in other matters display a medieval ignorance about those who cannot see. We need to realize today there are those that cannot see. There are those that have eyes that can't see. A few days ago, I went to a, a, a checkup on my eyes. And I knew that I was going to preach this message. Matter of fact, I was concerned last Sunday when uh, Brother uh, Ryan uh, preached the message. And he talked about focusing. I don't know he's going to preach my, preach my message. But uh, so I, I, I'm just finishing what he, he stopped. But uh, anyway, I went for a checkup the other day. And, uh, anyway, I do know I, I, I did some research before I went, and it says the pupil, uh, when the pupil is small, that's when great, great light comes in. When the pupil is um, large, then that's when darkness is there. In other words, when you walk in a dark room, your pupils go wide. You walk into a great light, your pupil's small. And so I, the, the, nurse was, the nurse was talking to me, and, and um, so I was kind of sharing with her what I was going to preach on today. And, and uh, anyway, and so, um, but she, uh, she had to dilate my eyes. So I asked her a question. I said, well, what happens, what happens when you dilate your eyes? And she said, what happens is that your eyes, you're able to uh, look behind uh, your eye and make sure uh, your eye is healthy. And I'm thinking that, that Jesus knew this. And I think Jesus walks in. The Bible says that Jesus walks in the midst of the, the candlestick. Where two or three are gathered in my name, that I will be also. Jesus walks in, and, and I'm thinking that he's asked the question, can they really see? Can this group see? And I'm sure that, that God uh, is wanting to be able to dilate your eye today. And you see, that's why today we're so quick. We're qu so quick to finish the song. We're so quick to finish the sermon. We're so quick to get out of church because you see, we don't want God to go behind what we see. Go behind the eye and realize that I haven't prayed like I should have prayed. I haven't seen God like I haven't seen God. I haven't been obedient. And God is able to examine that. There's a story in the Bible that says that Mary and Martha, they um, invited Jesus for supper. And Jesus was there in, in the midst of them. And Martha was busy, you see. And, and she started, Lord, tell your, my sister Mary 
to help me. Mary was at the foot of Jesus. Mary, and, the, and Jesus says, Mary seeks the good part. Or Mary is looking, if you please. Mary is beholding. Mary is seeing. Mary is looking beyond me and realizing that I am the lamb that was slain. Realizing I am the king of kings. Realizing I am worthy of, of, of worship. I am today who I say I am. Mary, all Mary, Martha was seeing was stuff. Dirty dishes, maybe. She said maybe, maybe uh, somebody needs to sweep the floor. Maybe something is going on, but she, she had eyes only to see. And I'm afraid that that's where some Christians are today. They have eyes only to see about church. They see church work, church activity. One pastor that had the largest church in the world said this, the greatest enemy uh, of, uh, of the church is activity. Activity. The church could be so busy that, that it forgets to see God, to look beyond the natural. And I'm talking about a pastor who had the largest church uh, uh, in America at that time. I'm talking about a pastor that who had uh, 142 ministries. But yet, he said, activity, but what he was saying is, he had all these ministries, but every one of them was focused. You see, if your ministry is not focused on what is God, if your ministry is not focused on seeing God through whatever it is, then we're missing the mark. We're not being the church that God wants us to see. We're not being the church that's able to behold him, to be able to hold him. One day he's going to come. One day he's going to come. And he's going to, the Bible says, that every eye shall behold him. We're going to see him. We're going to see him. Forevermore. Forevermore. Thank you for allowing me to be here today at Oak Grove Church. A great church. A great church. And thank you for everything. And now, I think they have an announcement, so if you stay tuned. Well, good morning. It's so good to be here this morning. I sure do miss each and every one of y'all and can't wait till we get back in church together. I'm here to make a few announcements. Um, I've brought my papers so I don't mess up and forget anything, so if y'all bear with me, I'm going to be looking at that. Um, we, the official board, we have been diligently praying and have been in close contact with each other throughout this pandemic while making decisions for Oak Grove that's gonna affect each and every one of us. This has not been a task that we have taken lightly and the decisions that we have made have been done with all of you, our church family and our community in mind. We have been in continuous contact with the Bishop Greg Amos and have recently met with him to discuss the opening of our church for in-house services. We have decided to ease our way back into having these in-house services beginning the first Sunday in June, June the 7th. Services will begin Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We have all been worshiping from home, but we wanna give the opportunity of worshiping together to those who are able and are in the not at risk category. We wanna make sure that we take all the necessary precautions for everyone's well-being and safety. Therefore, we are only going to have services on Sunday morning. This service will consist of praise and worship and preaching. There will be no Sunday school, no children's church, no Sunday night services or Wednesday night services at this time. We will continue to live stream our services on Facebook. Live streaming will begin at 10 a.m. instead of 11 a.m. Please know that we do not want anyone to feel obligated or pressured into being in the church building for services. We want you to feel safe. We encourage everyone to stay home and watch our services from home, especially if you are in any of the at-risk categories that would make you susceptible to catching the virus. Your safety is important to us and we understand if you do not feel safe to come out at this time, we encourage you to watch with us from home. 
We are putting safeguards in place for those of you who decide to join us for these in-house worship services. We will reevaluate these safeguards on a month-by-month -month basis. For everyone's safety, we encourage you to follow and consider these guidelines. If you do not feel well or you have a fever for any reason, we ask that you stay home. Feel free to wear your mask covering your nose and mouth. We ask that you maintain the recommended six foot social distance. Refrain from handshaking and hugs. That's a hard one, I know. Please do not congregate in the vestibule. Doors will be propped open before and after each service to reduce the contact. Every other pew will be blocked off. Families in the same household are encouraged to sit together on the same pew. Non-family members, are encouraged to sit at the opposite ends of pews. No bulletins will be passed out. Any upcoming events will be announced during services through e email and posted on Facebook. The offering plates will not be passed around during services. There will be a basket at the entry of the sanctuary for you to place your tithes and offerings in as you arrive or as you are leaving the services. Those of you who are not able to join us for in-house services are asked to continue to mail in your tithes and offerings to Tanya Dansler. During dismissal, please maintain social distancing as you exit the sanctuary and the church. Finally, as stated earlier, the official board has been in continuous contact with Bishop Amos. We met with the bishop to review some resumes, and we are in the process of interviewing pastors for Oak Grove. We ask each of you to continue to pray for us and for our church. We ask that your prayers be, not my will, but your will be done. We want God's, we want who God wants for Oak Grove. We love each of you and we are here for you. And if you need anything, please do not hesitate to contact one of us. And don't worry, I know I've said a lot today. All of this will be posted on Facebook, and I will be sending out an email later on today with all of this information. We love you so much. God bless you.